Welcome to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast for farmers and ag professionals by the Iowa Farm Bureau, bringing you the news, experts, and educational insights that matter most. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our September 5th edition of The Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and in today's episode, we'll bring you a conversation on national ag priorities with American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval, who was in Des Moines for Iowa Farm Bureau's President's Conference last month. Then we'll bring on Mike Steenhook, who's the Executive Director of the Soy Transportation Coalition, to talk about railroad reliability concerns and other transportation topics as we approach harvest. First up is President Zippy Duval, who joined spokesman reporter Bob Bion during last month's President's Conference. We are here today with Zippy Duval, president of American Farm Bureau Federation. Welcome to Iowa and the County Presidents Conference. Let's start there. What is your message going to be today to the Farm Bureau County Presidents? Well, first off, I'm excited about being here and being with County Presidents or grassroots members, the best part of my job. That's where I love being. So uh, this is the kind of meeting I like to go to because I get to talk about what American Farm Bureau is involved in what we're doing. And so I'll talk a little bit because I know they got some new County Presidents here, a little bit about you know, what does American Farm Bureau bring to the table? We bring nine experienced lobbyists that work from our policy book every day. We've got a team of five economists. There's not many ag economists left in, in Washington, and, and everybody looks to our economists. For, and, and if you're interested in what they're saying, the market intel on our website is a great place to go look and see what they're saying about all the issues that face us. Uh, and then, you know, we do a lot of program work. We do a lot of mental health work. My job is really developing those relationships and pushing that policy forward, too. So, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Then I'm going to talk about some of the issues that I've heard talk about across the country. I do a lot of traveling to talk to our grassroots. Uh, I think it's important to hear their story and their issues and be able to take it back to Washington. And then at the end, I want to talk to them about how important they are as county presidents, how important their members are, and how crucial it is for us to be a very intensive policy development process so that our policy is current uh, in line with our other commodity groups so that when we go to Washington we're all speaking from one page and so that we can provide one united voice for American farmers. So on Thursday I attended a roundtable discussion with Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack and U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. Farmers and ag groups asked for a focus on input costs as a result of tariffs and the biotech concerns with Mexico. These are major concerns for Iowa farmers. Can you address those and the efforts of Farm Bureau on those key issues? Uh, sure. First of all, I'd like to say that Secretary Vilsack has been absolutely wonderful to communicate with and work with. Couldn't ask for a better partner. You know, coming off Sonny Purdue, who was a friend of mine, uh, Secretary Vilsack has stepped right up and you know, if I call him or text him, he'll return that and we'll have some good conversations. So Mr. Vilsack and U.S. Trade Rep uh, Catherine Ty coming to Iowa was very important for them to come here and talk about those things. So it doesn't surprise me the issues that came up because we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about inputs. Uh, that's the number one thing I hear all across the country is what are we going to do about these inputs and fuel costs. And, of course, we all know that the breakdown of the supply chain has hurt a lot of that. Uh, lack of labor has hurt a lot of that. We have met with all the fertilizer companies and talked about, you know, the burden that this is putting on our farmers and ranchers and the worry we have about having availability next year. And what if commodity prices move lower, will we be able to afford it? And then you've got to think about what can I get an operating loan? So it's just a chain event around us. So we've communicated with all the fertilizer companies. We've talked to the Trade Commission about uh, tearing down any barriers or any tariffs is uh, restricting some of those from coming in here. Uh, we've also talked about the uh, intense regulations on building new facilities. We need to have more facilities in our country. And then we've also answered the question, well, what can we do to help farmers? Will you help participate and be a partner with us to establish some on-farm storage? Uh, so in the future, if availability is probably maybe we already have it stored and, and we can buy it at the right price too. So those are the areas we talked about there. When you talk about Mexico and biotech, yeah. uh, we've had talks uh, with uh, the ambassador 
uh, for Mexico from the U.S. about what how important it is. We talked to his staff, talked about how important the acceptability of biotech and glyphosate and how it's going to affect agriculture, especially corn and soybeans. I've also had Mexican uh, officials in my office, and we had a really difficult conversation with them about that. And then to our counterpart in Mexico, the it's not a Farm Bureau, but it's an organization uh, almost similar to that. The leader of that is Juan Cortina. Uh, Juan and I have become friends, and we're constantly communicating. They have some of the same concerns we do. They want those tools and technologies at their fingertips in Mexico to be able to grow crops down there. And I asked him what's his number one problem in Mexican agriculture, and he'll, he told me labor. So we're working with our counterpart down there trying to join hands and help talk to their government about the importance of the acceptability of biotech and, and, and glyphosate. What else are you hearing across the country as concerns drought perhaps or other issues? Yes, you know, it's a whole list of them. You know, the first one you hear is input costs. The second one you'll hear most often is labor. If you're out west, yes, it's drought and the availability of water and, and, and to be able to establish uh, a plan for the future with all the people moving in out there. and People need water, but agriculture does too. And really and truly, if you go look at those water systems, uh, the farmers in the early 1900s, one that started all those water systems, and they're amazing to see. Uh, but yes, uh, that, that is important. And then, of course, you know, you go into the south, you talk about beef prices, you'll talk a lot about poultry regulations, rules and regulations that were making comments on now, market availability overseas in the Asian rim. You go up in the northeast, you talk about land availability, deer pressure on their crops, and consumer opinions of what they're doing. And, you know, and I come to the Midwest and I'd ask our farmers, what are you talking about? And I know it's about ethanol and RFS and, you know, all the things that are important about that infrastructure around ethanol. So. Uh, we continue to try to face all those issues and lend a voice to every one of them uh, based on our policy. So Congress is coming back from recess. What do you expect the main ag issues to be and to be discussed? So we hear some rumbling that the Senate is working towards maybe dropping something in the labor area. We have been pushing hard for certain things to be changed from the bill that came out of the House and hopefully they have heard us. I know that we've been intensively engaged in those conversations. Either they haven't put it in writing or they aren't willing to give it to us. So we would love to see something in writing so that we could evaluate it and take it back to my board to see if it's close enough to our policy that we could support. The rumor is that they may drop it uh, right before election. So we'll see, and I hope they just drop it in time that we can uh, do a good study on it. I think the second thing is you know, we're gearing up for the Farm Bill discussion. I think there'll be a lot of talk this fall about Farm Bill and the pieces in the Farm Bill that's important to farmers is crop insurance, uh, making sure that we broaden it and make sure we fund it. It's conservation. How is climate smart farming practices going to blend with conservation? Because conservation is the best way to do climate smart practices. And it's about Title I. Uh, are those uh, target prices and are those programs, do they need to be modernized? Because there's a lot of difference in the cost, the price of commodities and inputs now than what it was before when they were, they were set. And then, of course, about nutrition. And the big fight will be over nutrition and funding of nutrition and what the requirements are to get, get help. It needs to be a hand up, not a handout. And I think putting those sideboards on that program is just a very difficult conversation for them. And lastly, what's your general thoughts on the farm economy today and moving into 2023? You know, it's uh, been amazing. It's a little different across the country. As a whole, I think farmers are still really in uh, very optimistic and in, in really a good mood. I think commodity prices have helped that, not so much in beef uh, prices. But then there's a lot of pressure coming on to agriculture through their state governments. And probably the farmers that I worry about the most are the ones in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to be the most depressed, and most of that's coming from their their state officials and, and the regulations uh, that are being put on, on, on them there. But as a whole, 
Uh, farmers are still very optimistic. They're still excited about the future. They're real excited about the technologies coming. They're concerned about the crop protection tools that we may possibly either get some taken away from us or limited and what's going to happen there. But overall, I think everybody's in pretty good mood. And next year may be different because going in 23, it's going to be about getting a farm loan, not knowing what the availability is of inputs and the cost of them. That's a good recap of some of the hottest issues facing U.S. farmers right now. You also heard some interesting regional insights from President Duval based on the stops he's making in states across the country. Next, we have Mike Steenhook of the Soy Transportation Coalition. As we head into harvest, there's a lot of focus on what's happening to the crops in our fields. Mike joins us to talk about the transportation systems that will ultimately carry those crops to customers around the world. Spokesman reporter Tom Block has the story. Mike, railroad service times have been a problem facing grain shippers this year with unfilled grain car orders and increased wait times. What does the current situation look like compared to previous years, and what factors are causing the delays? There's a lot of frustration about the the current condition of rail service, and it's been this this way over the last you know one to two years. You know, railroads are struggling with the same dilemma that other transportation providers are struggling with, and that is a, a scarcity of labor. If you really wanted to identify what's the real number one culprit for this decline in reliability that the railroad providers are experiencing, it is that shortage of labor. And, you know, they're, they're working hard to try to hire new workers in all areas of their operations, but it continues to lag. And so we're, we're continuing to see a lot of challenges with rail service, and it's less so the cost of rail service, and it's more the reliability or lack thereof of rail service. So, you know, I talked to a, a rail shipper from, you know, the western part of the corn and soybean belt recently, and normally the shipments to the Pacific Northwest with this particular soybean processor is about a five-day journey out, a five-day journey back, so a 10-day round-trip journey. So if you have a 10-day round-trip journey, that results in a in three turns per month that you can count on for that particular rail car. Now, all of a sudden, what they're experiencing is about a seven to eight-day journey out, seven to eight-day journey back. So now, all of a sudden, you're looking at a 14 to 16-day round-trip journey. Well, you can only get two turns per month for that particular rail car, a covered hopper car or a tank car. So that all of a sudden you have less infrastructure to be able to transport a given amount of volume. So his recourse had to be purchasing and leasing additional rail cars for a considerable expense in order to be able to accommodate what they produce. So there's real world ramifications of this. It's not just an irritant. There's an actual economic problem that's associated with this and we're seeing it throughout throughout the country and so it is it clearly is a real challenge that we're experiencing right now as we're moving into harvest time here in iowa in the midwest what are the potential impacts on soybean and corn farmers if there's a bigger interruption in the system well there's a lot riding on the shoulders of the american farmer right now we have still a, an overall a, a healthy harvest that we're expecting uh, you know, the verdict is still obviously out on that, but we have strong demand. We have global food shortage. So there's a lot riding on the shoulders of the American farmer to be able to satisfy this demand. And if our railroads are not up to the task of being able to accommodate that, you're going to have an additional costs, inefficiencies, and in being able to connect supply with demand. And, you know, during this time with all of the concerns that we have and all of the turmoil, Globally, uh, this is a time for our supply chain to be operating as efficiently as possible. You know, we've had some real problems with our supply chain over the last couple years, and that's not going to go away. But I, I think what I really try to underscore is this is the time for, amidst all of our problems, this is the time for our supply chain to get better, not to decline. And there's kind of a worry that, you know, we could see a decline in, in service, and that obviously doesn't help anyone, including farmers. So what are some of the potential solutions to work our way out of these kind of log jams and return to a more predictable schedule? 
Well, I think, you know, that there's really no silver bullet, but, you know, there's a number of things that, you know, we can ensure, you know, number one, something that we're, we're focusing on is there's current negotiations between labor unions, railroad worker unions, and the railroads themselves. And, and there's a, a period that we're currently in where they're considering proposals that uh, the administration and, the, their, and its appointed presidential emergency board submitted to both parties. And by September 16th, they need to arrive at a new contract between, again, these railroad workers and about 115,000 of railroad workers that are represented by these negotiations and the nation's largest railroads. And if they don't come to an agreement, uh, it is possible you could see a work slowdown, you could see a stoppage, and that would obviously be detrimental. And we want to, so something we want to make sure that happens right now is have an agreement, a new contract that benefits railroads, that benefits railroad employees, but allows the rail sector to be able to provide improved service for its customers. And and it's never a good time to have any kind of slowdown or diminishment of service uh, within the rail industry. It's particularly a bad time to do it when we're on the eve of harvest. So we, we clearly need to make sure that those contracts come to a conclusion and we're able to, again, take steps to improving rail service rather than see it decline. Yes, and as you mentioned, it is an issue that's serious enough that the government has seen justification to get involved with recommendations for the contracts. And as well as the Surface Transportation Board has asked for some reports from the railroads just to see if those service times can be improved. Yeah, and that, that so we are very pleased that this has gotten the attention of our, our leadership. You know, a lot of times infrastructure and supply chain issues, uh, it, it's not a page one issue, it's a page three, four, five issue and doesn't really rise to the level of attention among our national leaders. Clearly, over the last couple of years, supply chain issues have gotten the attention of whether it's President Trump or President Biden, the, the, the leadership in Congress, agencies like the Surface Transportation Board. This is something that does have the attention of these individuals. So, you know, hopefully it will result in service and supp- these supply chain issues actually improving rather than getting worse. And that's something that none of us want to see. Let's move to another critical link in the supply chain, the river system. The infrastructure bill passed at the beginning of the year provided some money for lock and dam modernization. How do you think that funding will impact transportation projects that are important to agriculture? Well, that was a really big win for for agriculture, specifically the the green light for a new construction at Lock and M25, which is north of St. Louis. And this is going to be one of the first new construction projects on the upper Mississippi River for a considerable period of time. And this is something that farmers in Iowa and other states have long been advocating for. And, and, you know, to the point where it could be very, it could get really discouraging at times where, you know, farmers felt like every year they petitioned their government for funding for these important infrastructure projects only to be disappointed. And so, but this was just an example of that advocacy finally paying off. So this is going to be a new lock chamber at this site, which will allow longer barge flotillas to go through that lock chamber without having to get broken up and then reassembled after they go through that lock. And this is going to benefit all of the the production areas, whether it's in Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, Wisconsin, Minnesota, these states that all where so much soybean, so much corn is actually funneled to the river and then eventually gets exported from the New Orleans area. Those locks are really critical to the profitability of the industry. So we were really pleased to see this new investment announced earlier this year. And so we look forward to seeing it be completed. It's it's going to be a project that's going to take a number of years to complete. A $732 million project does require some time, but we're very pleased to see it get announced, moving forward with it. And you know, farmers really need to, to take credit for being able to get that project uh, receiving the green light. And it is an issue that's been talked about a long time. So it's, it's great to have at least a starting point. You can't fix a problem until you get started. What other potential improvement projects in the waterway system are you watching? 
we're we're very pleased that you know we're we're seeing continued progress on the area of the country that's responsible for year in and year out 60% of US soybean exports about 60% as well as US corn exports and that's the lower Mississippi River farmers and other stakeholders in Louisiana worked very diligently to be able to get that project to deepen that lower part of the river from 45 feet of minimum water depth to 50 feet of minimum of water depth and that project received the the green light in early 2020 uh, work actually commenced on the dredging activity in September of 2020. There was a recent announcement that the lower stretch of the river from the Gulf of Mexico to New Orleans, and so this is a 106-mile stretch of the river, has now had an upward revision of its water depth to 50 feet. So we're already at that up to New Orleans, and then 49 feet for another 75 miles. And it's significant because there's a lot of the soybean and grain export terminals that are located along the lower stretches of the river near New Orleans are within that footprint. So now all of a sudden these export terminals have the ability to load ships heavier with more revenue producing freight, whether it's soybeans, corn, or other any other product. And so it just makes us more competitive. Now, ultimately the goal is to get that river to a full 50 feet all the way up to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That's, so that's a 256 mile stretch of the river. So there's still more work to be done, but it really is just a testament to you know, leadership in Louisiana, Midwestern organizations, the Soy Transportation Coalition, the United Soybean Board, and so many other agricultural organizations really emphasize this issue. And it's really going to pay dividends for us. So it's an example of, of an infrastructure project that's going to make the American farmer, particularly in those areas that are located near the Mississippi River, much more competitive. And that's something that we're very proud of. And you alluded to this earlier, but railroads, ports, and even river infrastructure can seem a little far removed from the farm. Why should Iowa farmers care about transportation? Yeah, you know, when your reality is that so much of what you produce is consumed internationally, you can't just concern yourself with growing the crop, and you can't just concern yourself with having demand for that crop. There's a critical step, and that's connecting the two, connecting supply with demand. And for farmers that are located in Iowa and other states you know, in the Midwest, you're going to be located 900, 1,000 miles, maybe even 1,500 miles if you're considering the, the West Coast. That's a considerable distance between where these crops are grown and where they're ultimately exported from. And so you, you have to make sure that you've got this multimodal system that, that includes trucking, rail, barge, and then, of course, the condition of our ports themselves. And if you don't have that infrastructure in place that's well-maintained, well-capitalized, then we're not going to be competitive in the international marketplace. And you know, all you have to do is go visit certain areas of Brazil. And while Brazil has made you know, progress over the years on improving their infrastructure, you still see a lot of these dilapidated roads, a very primitive rail infrastructure. And so you know, farmers in in that part of, of Brazil, they don't have the profit opportunity that a lot of American farmers do, not because they don't grow good crops, because they do, and not because there's not demand for it, because there is, but they just have a, an inefficient transportation system that, that connects supply with demand. So you know, the lesson that we need to continue to remind ourselves of is investment is not just a one-time activity. It needs to be a perpetual activity. And whether you're a country, whether you're an industry, great nations, great industries continue to invest in themselves. And that includes our infrastructure. So we've got to make sure that we just don't take it for granted. We have to continue to improve it in any way that we possibly can. Moving a little closer to home, local roads and bridges are something that every farmer sees firsthand as the first link in moving grain from the farm into the supply chain. You, a year ago or so, released a report that had some innovative ideas for replacing bridges that are considered deficient to keep those bridges open so we don't resort to closures or, you know, restrict their weight loads. Tell us a little bit about that report and some things that you're doing in that regard. Yeah, one of the real concerns that we have had and we continue to have is, you know, when you consider a lot of these rural bridges, and we're not talking about 
the Golden Gate Bridge. We're talking about rural short span bridges. It's very common for those bridges to cost a half million dollars, $800,000. And when you consider the price tag of a lot of these bridges, and you consider that a lot of these counties, they don't have that money just sitting in a, in a checking account that they can just spend ad infinitum on these, on these bridges that need to be replaced. So what that tells us is that we need to be addressing this issue of our rural bridges, not exclusively on the revenue side of the equation, just hoping for more money. We also have to look at the cost side of the equation. How can you make the taxpayer dollar stretch further? And so we issued this report last year in which we featured 20 innovative concepts, 10 for replacing a rural bridge, 10 for repairing rural bridges, so 20 total, that really emphasized that you can do a much more effective job of maintaining and replacing these rural bridges for a fraction of the cost without compromising safety. So that was really important. They had to be sound from an engineering perspective. So we issued this report and now what we're doing this year is that we're providing a series of grants to a county if they're interested in, in doing it or it could be a municipality or whoever who owns the bridge, you know, provided that it's a bridge that farmers utilize we would provide some funding to help underwrite some of the pre-engineering design expenses of replacing that bridge or doing a major rehabilitation of that bridge if they use one of the concepts featured in this report. So it's just kind of a way to encourage this fresh kind of thinking when it comes to maintaining and improving our rural bridge inventory. So we're talking about replacing a bridge for say $100,000 versus $300,000 or $250,000 versus $600,000. So considerable cost savings, again, without compromising safety. And you know, oftentimes there's kind of a mentality that you find throughout life that people are not really open to something because it doesn't really conform with how they've done it for the last 20, 30 years. So this grant program that we have is kind of a way to provide that additional kind of encouragement incentive to look at this in, with some fresh perspective and maybe entertain the thought of maybe replacing one of these bridges one, via one of these innovative approaches. And if a county wanted more information on some of these innovative ideas, how could they contact you or find that information? You know, they can just go to our website at soytransportation.org. The report with the, the 20 concepts are featured on that. And then, you know, on the website, they can find the contact information for, for me and just reach out to me directly and we can discuss it further. I know we're all grateful to have some good news about our river infrastructure. But of course, we'll all be anxiously waiting to hear more news on the railroad front. And if you're interested in hearing more about those creative, cost-saving bridge repair and replacement solutions that Mike was referring to at the end of his interview, you can check out soytransportation.org, which is linked down in the notes for this episode. That's all for this episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. We hope you found it useful and that you'll join us for our next one on September 19th. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau, and thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.